have kind of two teams, you know, they're facing off against each other, and because scouting is quite different, and because you don't have this kind of anchor setup, I, I know I talked about that quite a lot, but this kind of anchor setup where you have like main tank in main, off tank is kind of covering an angle, usually helping a DPS cover an angle, and then because you have that setup, the supports are safe at the back, because for the enemy team to get to them, they either have to fight past the main tank, or fight through the um, kind of DPS with off tank support, or if they do want to, they can go kind of all the way around the map and do a big rotation. But because that rotation is so long, it gives that support in the backline ample time to rotate away. Usually off tank DPS going to lead the flank, whole team's going to pivot around the main tank, right? We had that set up basically every comp, basically every map in Overwatch 1. That was kind of that was kind of Overwatch 1 being solved, basically, right? That was that that was the end of Overwatch 1. Ever since season three playoffs where we saw those hog comps uh, coming out from Soul and Justice, you know, where we, they, they kind of really pushed that kind of flanking tempo playstyle to the max. That led into this type of playstyle, where you had the anchor setup, off tanks, backline, so on and so on. That led to this type of setup, and it meant that every comp, it didn't matter whether you were playing Ball Briggs End, it didn't matter whether you were playing kind of Orisa Bap, even the Rhine comps, like Monkey Anna comps too, Every comp pretty much had this type of setup. You had the main tank in main, off tank with the DPS covering the flank. Supports were then safe in the back. You don't have that in 5v5. Um, you know, mostly just because you don't have the off tank, right? And it means a couple of things. It means that you can pressure a tank away from main by shooting them. It means you can dive over the top of a tank in main a lot of the time without there being enough peel for the backline. So if the backline comes too far forward, you can just kind of jump straight past the anchor onto them, right? Um, your DPS, or oh sorry, DPS angles onto an anchor aren't contested. So someone can come around, shoot that anchor. There's no off tank over here to contest it. And if we get into that kind of playstyle where we're looking for these counter rotations, right? So let's say we had like the support over here, um, enemy team. Oh, sorry, we have the kind of support over here and they're looking to kind of do some sort of rotation. Because you don't have an off tank, there's no one to slow down the enemy as they are pushing behind you, right? So if you're attacking and you have no space and the enemy team already set up like this, if you try and just immediately push into one side of them, they can get behind you very, very quick, right? In 6v6, you could slow down this player, slow down this flank because you had an off tank, right? Because you had a diva that could matrix you as you were rotating. You had a sig that could fight this player for a little bit, then back up, that type of stuff. Again, you don't have that in, um, in 5v5, right? So the kind of play style of the game changed a little bit and... Because of that, we can kind of predict where things have ended up, and that is in this type of skirmish playstyle thing, right? Where scouting has changed, your default setup's changed, which means that when you are fighting an enemy team, you don't really know what's happening over here. You don't really know what's happening behind their lines. You don't really know what their setup is. You can't scout their flanks all the time. Um, opportunities aren't quite as obvious. So it's like you don't really know what's going on, on back here. The other thing as well is... Oh, sorry. The other thing as well is... It's very easy to dive in main, it's very easy to go for the supports, right? So if the supports are playing a kind of standard Overwatch 1 position, you can just kind of dive straight onto them and kill them, right? Similarly, DPS angles at the start in Overwatch 2, 5v5, DPS were kind of really abusing these flanks. You know, Genjis were running up really close to the team. Soldiers were you know, going on these big flanks, shooting the enemy backline. Um, but we don't really see that anymore because those two things happened. The backline was too easy to kill, so the backline started kind of playing in kind of funkier positions on the flank or going further back. And teams started getting better at punishing these flankers, right? So if a Genji was running up close on the flank, the team would, you know, run into them and kill them straight away, right? They would be scouted, they would be killed, so on and so on. So, and also because this backline is playing further back, they're not, that flank doesn't even do as much anymore, right? For a Genji to get, you know, a good flank on the backline, they, it either has to be a map with a lot of verticality that really works for the Genji, or it's got to be a kind of super, super long flank, which again, more time to be scouted by faster heroes like Tracer, um, more time to be rotated into and killed, more time to be rotated away from, so the flank doesn't do anything, right? So we had those kind of two things. Those kind of big DPS flanks didn't mean as much anymore, and the backline's playing further back. So what that led us to is this kind of skirmish play style that I keep going on about, right? Where you don't really know what's going on behind the enemy lines. So what you do instead is you kind of, every single person on the team puts on a little bit of pressure in their own way, right? So if you're a monkey, maybe you walk up and you have a threat versus the enemy supports, which are playing a little bit further back. 
If you're a Zen, maybe you're coming around the corner with right clicks, putting some spam out. If you're a Genji, maybe you're wall running up to the enemy team, kind of staying in cover, doing a bit of spam. Tracer's obviously great at doing that. Um, even Lucio's can do it by kind of wall, wall running up. A Brick can do it by kind of walking up towards the enemy team, but keeping bash, putting some pressure on. The important thing is that everyone's keeping their escapes open, right? So if you're a Genji and you're walking up into cover to do some spam, if the enemy team suddenly put pressure on you, you can still dash away, you can still stay alive, right? If you're that Brig walking up to put some pressure on, you're keeping the bash, so that if they put a load of pressure on you, you can turn around, you can bash out and stay alive, right? If you're that Zen, right, coming around on the corner for a right click, you're not getting too greedy, you're making sure that you can kind of back up, stay alive. Um, same for the monkey, you know, the monkey's walking up, he's taking, he's not running through main, he's taking a kind of funky path around the flank, so he can get into cover with his health, with his cooldowns, so that if four people run around onto him, he can, you know, jump away, stay alive, jump up, maybe stay alive for as long as possible, right? So that's what we kind of mean by skirmishing. Every single person on the team is putting on pressure, but they're keeping their escape options open. And what that means is that at some point, you know, again, everyone, everyone on blue team is kind of doing that, all putting pressure on, all keeping escape options open, all kind of keeping LOS with each other. At some point, someone on the enemy team is going to find a target to commit onto. They might see that Genji and go for the Genji. Because um, they're going to get frustrated. All these players on the blue team are taking these little bites out of them, right? They're walking forward, doing some damage, walking forward, um, maybe hitting some cooldowns, right? But they're not really spending anything. So what that means is when this red team commits onto a target, blue team, they still have all their cooldowns ready. You know, they still have most of their health pools, right? Which means that they can either turn around and, and kind of collapse on that dive. Maybe they can go for trades. Maybe they can just peel for this person while the person that's taking pressure just runs back and stays alive, right? Um, that's kind of what we're looking for with the, the skirmish play style, and we'll see that a lot in this in this match. This is probably my favorite example, and this is from the Gladiators one, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this in a minute. And here, just, we want to focus on the way that Fuel are playing the front line, right? In that they're coming forward on the corner, not really using a whole lot, right? Maybe a bubble, maybe some health pools, they're not coming on the coming on the corner. So here they come around, they poke the front line, right? And they force back uh, gladiators. Gladiators obviously see this and then come back in to re-engage. Yeah. They use and for this they use the visor. But because fuel have done this by just kind of walking in, using basic cooldowns, maybe a bit of health pools, they still have all of their important resources left. They're able to to take a disengage, right? And then you have well done, you forced out the visor. Then we do it a second time, right? Hanbin, see, he's walking up on the corner, he's putting on a bit of pressure. Enemy team sees him there, engage onto him. Rest of the team still has all the resources left in a great position to peel for him. And then they push back in. You didn't really, you didn't quite see it, but at the same time as they went for the re-engage, Edison TP'd up here, top left on the high ground. Now you're walking forward, Reaper's basically on an angle. You have your Nano Zarya full charge walking in. Not really a whole lot that lads can do from that situation, right? We'll, we'll watch it back again in a second. But again, we're seeing that type of skirmish play style really work well against these teams that are trying to play that type of harder dive where you just kind of go straight in. And um, like, I, I'm not really that convinced by, by the Doomfist picks in general. Um, maybe once we see players that are more kind of proficient on the Doom, it might, might work. There are some maps, like Oasis University, feels quite strong for Doomfist. But, yeah, just uh, the, the way that you can force these fights with Zarya, obviously it's a good point for Zarya, but like, the Zarya's come forward, able to force the enemy team, then you just push back in. So, what we're seeing with the skirmish playstyle is you have one team walking forward, not really using a whole lot, but everyone on their team is putting on pressure. Enemy team in response, is committing usually on kind of a single target, right? The same way as you would in Overwatch 1. These, this player that's been committed onto, in that case it was Hanbin, turns around focuses on staying alive, right? All they're trying to do is focus on staying alive, waste as much time, waste as much resources from the team that's engaging onto you. Meanwhile, the rest of the team, then they have a choice to make. Do they come back and try and peel for that player? Do they deal with, do they try and fight Maybe the Doomfist, if the Doomfist is coming in to chase that target, or do they go for a kind of trade, right? And we kind of saw all three there, right? We saw like the Anna and the Lucio. Or so, sorry, we saw the Anna kind of burst to your Hanbin and peel for Hanbin, right? 
we saw the Lucio come and kind of boop the Doomfist back. Um, while like Sparkle as well were focusing down the Doomfist, yeah? And then we saw Edison go for TP onto the flank, right? So we had all those things happening at the same time. We peeled for Harbin, nanoed him, kept him alive. We fought the Doom, pushed him away. And we had Edison TPing on the back line. So then Ants wasn't able to support with any ranged DPS, right? So that's the kind of thing we're looking for with the skirmish playstyle. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that in, in this match. Because we see a nice fight here. Like, we were very happy with what happens there. Because again, what, like, what we see, Armbin's walking forward. Enemy team turn around and engage them. Look at all these players. Look, we've got one, two, three, four with the Anna. Right? I don't know where the fifth player is. Uh, but we see all these players looking at the Tsar. Obviously we have Nano, so it's quite easy fight. But all these players commit on the Tsar. The Tsar's walked forward. She's forced this commitment. She trades out all these, all this attention, all these resources from these four players. She trades it for Bubble and for Nano, right? Meaning that Genji can run around. Where is he? Reaper? I don't know where Reaper is, but Reaper's, oh yeah, Reaper's right here. Reaper's going to be able to run in uncontested, basically, right? So again, we're thinking about this type of maneuver, this type of maneuver as a resource trade. And that uh, goes very well for them, right? Because to commit all those resources onto the Tsar gets negated by the bubble, by the nano, meaning that then you can kind of push push in. You find the, what's it called? The Doomfist on the, on the forward position. That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, also got a lot of vaults from Glads here, so... Okay, so that was a little bit, little bit too far forward for Hanbin, right? He's kind of breaking LOS with with his Anna. Um, obviously, this he just gets slept. It's kind of awkward. I don't really know what they're looking for here. Really, we would want Hanbin kind of maybe playing around this bus on the left. Fielder can walk up a little bit. Maybe you can leave Edison on point for now. While Fielder walks up, has nice LOS, pockets Hanbin, basically the same as he's doing before. Um, and then we look for like maybe an early engage with Blade in the bubble. Like I, I don't really know what Hamid is doing so far forward here. Like it, it, his, his spacing is okay, but he should probably be like over here on the left because he has more. There's more cover here. There's more places for him to hide. Um, just kind of gets unlucky. He gets caught by the sleep. Because again, it's like in this position, his escape options aren't open, right? Because if the enemy team run on him with a nano visor, they're gonna be able to kill him. Whereas if he was over here, kind of near the bus then his escape options are open because he can just kind of back up and hide, yeah? Um, and again, like, we, we, see, we see the difference between those two situations, yeah? One where he has a piece of cover that he can hide behind for, versus an advisor, and one where he's just out in the open and he dies, right? So, like... What we've got here? We've got the opening bubbles onto the... onto the Reaper, which I don't think did a whole lot. Don't really know what's happening. I can't really see a whole lot that's happening here, but I think these these opening bubbles weren't weren't enough, right? Like you don't want like you'd rather have Edison TP like here, like he teleports here, takes a bubble, and you make space that way. So Edison goes in with a the bubble, then just comes back after the enemy team put attention on him. Then after these cooldowns have been spent on the Reaper, you know, maybe Anna nades him, tries to sleep him, maybe Doom turns around, tries to punch him, maybe Genji commits a dash on him, that type of stuff. Right? After that commitment of cooldowns that's been forced by your reaper TPing in with bubble then you can go in with the beat and the blade right um, so like I don't know I don't, don't really know what's going on for for Glad here it's just that they didn't force out enough right like all that was was a doom punch in front line onto your reaper didn't get a good enough trade out, out of your bubble these fights are interesting here it's like we have a lot of teams try different setups and my favorite one honestly is Putting an Anna close, like you put the Anna close, you leave like the monkey or the doom on cart, and then you they dive up from cart. So Anna peeks spawn, nays it, sleeps it, whatever, in that area kind of over there. Then the Anna kind of drops back to the cart, keeps pushing cart as that doom or the monkey jumps over the top. Because again, like when you get to the kind of uh, I don't know what to call this. I guess like third point, second point. I guess we call this street, so we call this second point. I don't know. Once you get to that area of the map. You want to start the fights as early as possible. You don't want to allow the team to kind of run across bridge and start a fight like that. Bizarre, just kind of walk forward into the enemy team. What are we looking at here from Edison? 
What are we looking at here from Edison? Does he get booped? He's up top. Right. Does he drop in with a bubble? I don't know. I'm going to assume that Fanny Astro boops him off the high ground or something. But again, it's like, these are the types of fights you don't need to take if you're fuel, right? Like, you'd want to use that visor after the enemy team has used that, those initial cooldowns, yeah? So you're walking in with the Zar, the Zar's getting pocket, you're forcing maybe a flank from Kevster, you're forcing a die from Monkey, you're peeling versus it with bubbles, with speed boosts, with whatever, to survive that initial engage. As soon as you see Monkey use bubble, as soon as you see Anna use nade, then you're pushing back in, you know, with, with the visor, with the grav, you know, with the nano, whatever you've got, right? Like, that's, that's the way that fuel need to open these fights. They, they don't want to open them just by a kind of... They can open them by using visor. So soldier can come around on a corner, just open with visor. That's fine. But he's got to understand that he's not really aiming to get killed. He's using it either to take space so the team can walk forward or to force that monkey dive, right? So obviously, if a soldier just kind of runs up and uses visor, enemy monkey might probably want to dive him, you know, probably want to force him back. That's a you know, perfectly good way of using visor, right? Um, again, the important thing is that Edison's keeping his escape route open, which obviously in that fight he didn't, which is the reason why he got caught. I kind of like the brute force Zarya comp, but I think teams are misplaying it. Yeah, I think I think Fuel kind of figured it out towards the end. Because again, like this is the thing. It's actually there's a lot more to it than trying like brute force. I, I, I've seen people refer to these comps as like rush and stuff, like Zarya rush. Like it's not. Not Zarya rush, like, like we're not speed boosting Zarya in. Like, the strength of Zarya at the moment is is that she can play so split from the team, right? She has more health. She has bubbles that she can be greedy with for herself. She doesn't need a Lucio with her to do to do that much, right? The way Zarya works is that she can play split from the backline, which obviously the back line, the backline has to play very split in Overwatch 2 because if they play close, they will just get dived and, and killed. You know, they have to play a little bit further back. Or kind of on a flank, right? Um, Zarya worked really well in that because she has range bubbles, ranged bubbles, sorry, and she has like a much bigger health pool. Like we're not speed boosting Zarya's in and, and beaming people. They're actually playing in a very kind of measured way where you're walking forward, you're forcing an initial cooldown commitment, then you're re-engaging with the Zar. Because again, it's like we we see this type of thing here, right? So. I think this is, I wish they, the spectating was a little bit better. But we can see what happens here. So we, I, we're going to see the Zarya go on cart in a sec, right? So Zarya's on cart, right? Then we're going to see Kevsa go for this flank at the same time as Reiner, Reiner, I assume that's how you pronounce it, jumps over the top uh, with Primal. At the same time, Hanbin's on cart. And Hanbin, or like Zarya in general, can do the same job as like a dive tank. Because... You have these positions. Let's just say it's a corner, right? So like, have white. Let's say you have a corner like this, um, and your Zarya is playing on this corner. She actually has quite a lot of threat on that corner when she's high charge. She can walk forward and kill people kind of in this radius, you know, if she wants to. So what that means is the enemy backline. They don't really want to go further forward than that. You know, they've got to actually play quite far back, and that's the way the Zarya tanks in a lot of these situations. Is that she has that opening threat versus the kind of enemy backline the same way as like a monkey would have, right? So again, like if you had a monkey on this corner, he can kind of dive forward and he's zoning out the enemy backline from coming too close to his corner. Zarya can do the same. And if Zarya's doing that, it means that when they send these big dives, you know, this is basically what happens here, right? They send the tracer on the low ground and then they send the monkey on the high ground. Oh, sorry, the monkey like through main, right? The Zarya's in main, she's a threat versus the backline. So the backline... They can't, you know, follow through. They can't come, come past and go for, like, nades and sleeps. They can't speed boost in with the team because you have that Zarya that's splitting them off. The same way as if you had a monkey in main and drops his bubble, zones healing out. So these players, enemy backline, like, can't heal their divers, right? Zarya does the same thing. Um, and Zarya can force this engage, right? So if Zarya does this type of thing where she's walking forward, she's walking forward towards the enemy backline, right? As long, assuming she has kind of full health, full cooldown, so on. It's going to force an enemy commitment, right? They might go on to the Zarya she's walking forward. But if they do, she's really tanky. She's got bubbles. Maybe they even have sound barriers, nanos, that they're happy to give the Zarya. 
Or they might go for this type of thing where they go for the trade on the back line, which again just means Zarya can turn around bubble these players, but she can also walk forward so on the back line. And because the Zarya is walking forward and zoning the back line, this dive, this trade that the enemy team are going for with the Doom, with the Monkey, whatever they're playing, isn't going to be anywhere nearly, or sorry, isn't going to be anywhere near as strong as it would be if the Zarya was kind of allowing these backline heroes, you know, soldiers, Annas, Lucios, to come through and follow through with the dive. And that pretty much is what we see this fight, right? We see Kevsta, Rhino go on the flank, engage on the backline. Kevsta probably should hit this pulse. Um, but they go for this big engage. Fuel, obviously, counter it with the Nano on the Soldier in the backline, that's fine. But the reason why this fails, you know, a Nano on the Soldier shouldn't be enough to protect versus a big dive, right? The dive fails because Ants, Shu, and Funny Astro aren't able to come in and follow through, right? That's, that's why it fails. They're not able to come and follow through with these targets. And they're also not able to catch these players playing forward, right? So we can see, what's it called? Fielders here, Chewers here, Edison's here, right? So right now we have no healing for our Zarya, no healing for our Reaper, right? But Zarya and Reaper don't need healing. They can sustain by themselves for like, what, like five seconds, maybe? Ten seconds? If, like if our Zarya is playing like super careful. Because again, she has more health, she has more bubbles. Reaper is kind of independent a little bit with, with the shift uh, and the self-heal. Right, so it doesn't really matter that these players are getting zoned, um, because Hanbin has walked forward, forced this dive that doesn't really have a whole lot of support. Yes, it has a pulse. Yes, that's a primal, but not really a whole lot of support other than that. So it's pretty easy to peel versus this dive. In the meantime, we have Hanbin and Sparkle zoning out these three players, right? Because again, like these long dives through main, they just aren't as good anymore, right? They just aren't as strong anymore. Armin's got to be careful here. He's, he's allowed a lot of his bubbles to get forced. And I think Edison's getting too greedy on the visor again. Again, it's like, we don't care if, if Edison gets kills or doesn't get kills with the visor, right? This visor here, when does he pull it? So he pulls it here, forces... So what's that? Ryan is forced back. Funny Ash is forced back. All these players are hiding, right? We do want to take space with the visor, but we don't... We're not really that crazy. There's not really any positions that we really care about at this point, right? There's not really anything that we care about. In fact, we'd probably want to leave Hanbin kind of further back on the bus, have Sparkle play point, and try and bait and engage in, like that, bait and engage back onto our Anna at the back of the map. Like, I, there's no reason to be forced in fights. We even see Sparkle... What on earth is Fielder doing in this position? I, I'm not sure, right? Full first cart push when cart is going this slowly, you know, it's going super, super slow. There's no reason to be playing this far forward, you know? Hampin can play on cart when cart's there, because then he can go back to the bus, play at the bottom of the stairs here, that's fine, right? As soon as it gets kind of past this line, we probably just want to leave Sparkle by on like, on cart, sorry, by himself. Have the rest of the team taking positions at the back where they can catch and engage, right? So if that is if they go on Sparkle, they can peel for Sparkle. If they go on Hanbin, he's playing a little bit further back, they can peel for Hanbin. If they go all the way at the back and try and go for kind of Fielder and uh, Edison, then you still have quite an easy time, right? Again, we see this kind of playstyle where it's not so much playing defensively, but it's kind of setting up for an enemy engage, setting up for to kind of counter this big dive coming in main. You set up to counter that big dive coming in main, and then you force that dive to come in main by walking forward, forcing cart, by going forward as, as Zarya putting on pressure, by peeking an angle as Anna and spamming a little bit, right? And that's kind of what we're seeing teams begin to perfect. That play style of going forward, setting, taking a setup where you can always catch an enemy dive when it comes in, and then forcing the enemy team to take that type of big kind of dive through main, right? And again, the way to force that is just by everyone walking forward, putting on a bit of pressure. So they do win the fight, mostly because beat and grab are super, super strong. All play style. This type of play style more focused on forcing an enemy engage, countering the enemy engage, than just kind of diving straight in yourself. Because again, remember, we're, it's, it's kind of rare that we have a solution this, the way that we had in 6v6. So it's like, in 6v6, we talked a lot about a solution, like, for the dive. What that means is, backliner here, first part of the solution is an angle, right? So we have an angle onto the backline, so usually we engage in main, and we have an angle. Second part of the solution is ultimates, right? So obviously if we have, like, a nano, then we can engage. We, we have a solution just to engage. 
Third part of the solution is backline proximity, right? So our backline has got to be close enough to come through and follow through with the engage. In 6v6, we kind of had to have these things to go for a big dive, right? We saw this in the like Wrecking Ball uh, Briggs N comps, right? Where so much of the damage in those comps actually came from the Briggs N kind of pushing through and punching people to, de people to death, right? So when you were going for the big dives, you'd actually see the Briggs N close distance, set up pretty close, then push in whenever the ball slammed. We saw the same with the kind of Monkey Zarya comps, right? You had like Monkey Zarya, Brigana. The monkey would dive in, do these kind of little soft dives that would enable the backline to get into position. And then as soon as that Zarya, Brigana trio were kind of close enough to the enemy team, as soon as they were kind of in range of the enemy team, the next dive the monkey took would be kind of big one to commit as his kind of brawl core pushed in behind it, right? And we, we saw that with all with basically every comp. In 5v5, it's slightly different because we don't, it's pretty rare that we have a solution like that on the enemy team. Unless the enemy backline's playing super close, it's pretty rare that we can dive straight in through main and, and kill them, you know? We could if people were playing slower comps, but that's kind of part of the reason why we're seeing the Lucio more, right? And that the only counter to these kind of big engages through main because we don't have an off tank, we don't have the anchor set up, right? We don't have that main tank in main that can slow down, or sorry, that can kind of stop enemies pushing past them. We don't have the off tank on the flank that can stop enemies flanking, right? Because we have these tools to engage versus the backline, the only real way to survive these engages is to, to not be there, right? You just got to run away. And that's why we're seeing the Lucio, because when a big engage like that comes in, you can speed boost back, survive it, then counter, or sorry, then just focus down the people that jump in. And we're seeing that a lot with the Zarya comps, right? Because obviously Zarya fits that playstyle quite nicely. So obviously we missed first five, just go and look at it quick. And I'm pretty sure this is a good example of it, because... What do we see? So, we see Dallas walk up main. I don't know why they've kind of been given so much space here. Wait, no, this is fine actually, I don't, I don't care about this. Edison's already TP'd through. Edison probably should have been chased down and killed, but that's fine. So now Edison's through. Probably going to take a bubble here to put some pressure on. Again, it's forced. Okay, Edison's here with bubble, putting on pressure. Hanbin's here, putting on pressure as well. And it's forced Reiner, the monkey, to go for this trade. Because, again, you've got to do something. You can't let them just kind of walk up and kill you. So it's forced the monkey to go for a trade. But because you force the monkey to go for a trade and you haven't really spent anything to do it, all you've spent is like, what, 75 health from Hanbin in like a bubble on Edison? That's not, that's not a big investment, right? Which means the rest of the team can very easily set up for and save all their cooldowns for the moment when the kind of dive tank is forced to go in, right? Same, so this could be a monkey, could be a Doomfist, same type of thing, right? Which then means you're very, very free to focus the monkey, force them out, push them away. And then this monkey, he's used bubble, he's used jump. Now's the time to go, yeah? So now we should see, whole team's gonna push in, in this downtime. Monkey's got no jump, he's got no bubble, nothing he can do, right? So now we can push him, now we can kill him. And like, this is a really important thing to understand that this isn't a kind of rush comp. We're not just kind of rushing in and killing stuff. We're spreading out, we're using things like TP and Reaper bubble. Tracer can do the same when she blinks in with bubble. Zarya is doing it herself just by kind of walking in main and, and zapping people. We're doing those types of maneuvers that are forcing the enemy team to go for an engage. Then we're focusing on denying that engage and then pushing when they're trying to stabilize, when they're trying to reset their cooldowns, right? In 6v6, we had an off tank that could help this monkey reset his cooldowns, yeah? You can imagine if we tried chasing this monkey now and he had his own Zarya or maybe had a diva on the corner, the diva could kind of slow down the rate at which we were chasing the monkey. But again, because like yeah the diva could shoot us she could drop in front of us um she could fly into us boop us back a bit then go then go back to point right so with an off tank you had ways to kind of slow down a team that was pushing in your downtime in 5v5 you don't have that so as soon as a main tank has used their cooldowns like that it's you know it's it's free you know you can just chase and push um and that's what we're seeing from that's what we're seeing in this matchup right and it's a it's a really really good way to play overwatch 2 really really good way to play overwatch 2 and obviously it is easier with the Zarya, but you would see it with the monkey as well. It's the same type of place with the monkey, right? The other thing we just saw is Fielder sprinting into Moose, right? It, it, I think we did, right? That wasn't, yeah. The other thing we saw is Fielder sprinting into Moose, yeah? 
coming in with the team and fighting. He can only do that if you've already forced out these opening monkey cooldowns, yeah? If you tried doing this when Reiner was, you know, full health, jump and bubble, there's no way he's going to get away with that. But because Dallas are playing in a way that's forcing out those cooldowns early from Reiner, it means that then, uh, what's it called, Fielder is free to run in. Free, like, free to use that speed boost to chase the enemy team. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, we see this type of thing. Edison's TPing in. What do we see in response? Reiner's jump back. We've forced out the monkey jump already, right? And this is a great trade for the Zarya comp. Assuming that Edison stabilizes, drops back to the team, we can think, like, from the perspective of the rest of the team, they now have a decent period of, you know, five, ten seconds where they can do whatever they want. Typically, on the attack, that means they're going to try and rotate into a stronger position. Um... They have the Nano, so maybe they'll look to like rotate in, maybe Nano the Zarya on high ground, but if they had a Grav or a Beat, they'd definitely be looking to do that, right? Edison TP's top, creates a distraction, rest of the team speed boosts up uh, in the castle with Grav, with the sound barrier, whatever, right? Uh, I don't think we double bubble Edison here, I don't think that's the play, I don't, I don't know about that one. So he's just used one bubble here. Uh, then he's Wraith, waiting for the second bubble. He gets the second bubble. He unfortunately does get chunked out just before the bubble comes through, but I don't think we need it. I don't think it needs to happen. You know? Like... If the enemy team had no cooldowns, then maybe you go for it, but... I don't know. I don't think it needs to happen. I think carts all the way back here. You'll find take these cycle engages where the Reaper goes up, then goes back to the team, then goes up, then goes back to the team. I don't. I don't think there's pressure on uh, fuel to try and push this this hard. Very odd. Very odd. I I, I, don't, I don't know what that's about. Because remember, we're not expecting the Reaper to carry the fight. We're TPing him and we're TPing him in early just to create a bit of space. Kind of the same way that Monkey did right in the Monkey Zarya metas. So like, I, I don't really know what we're seeing there. Like, like Reaper's already made the distraction. We don't need to commit more resources onto our Reaper, right? Like this is what we want. We want him going up on high ground, creating space, then dropping back to the team. That's what we want, right? Because again, all we've committed is um, like a Reaper TP in a Zarya bubble, right? It's a very small commitment. Same thing here, what do we got? Don't commit too hard. That's fine. Obviously Sparkle gets caught in the meantime. He shouldn't be getting caught. I don't know if Genji is really the best hero for it. Yeah. Probably not versus uh, this comp. Before, the, like at the start of the stream, right? And this is kind of one of the best examples of that skirmish playstyle. Yeah. So we're looking, we're looking consistently at the way that fuel, without using much, right? Maybe they use a personal bubble, right? Maybe they use a Reaper TP. I think we're about to see Edison TP to this position, right? But they're not really using a whole lot. They're not spending that much of their health pool. They're not committing any critical cooldowns. They're not critic like most important thing. They're not putting themselves in a kind of dangerous position. They always have an escape route open. Yeah. And every every member of the team's doing that. Every member of the team's doing that. And at some point it's gonna force gladiators to commit to some sort of dive, right? So Edison's on this angle spamming a bit. What's it called? Uh Hambin comes around on the corner, does a bit of spam. What does it do? It forces this doom engage. Yeah. Then, the rest of the team just backs up. Very, very happy. You force that Doom to come in, you've spammed him a little bit, you're fine with that. Then we do it again, yeah? We come around on the corner, we put some pressure on. Again, we're not really committing any critical cooldowns for it, right? Because anyway, what happened? Rhino was forced in, fight here for a little bit. You know, we didn't commit any cooldowns, we're able to fox him, run back. Now we're putting on the pressure, escape route is still open, and it's forced out the visor. Yeah, so now what do we see? Team just backs up, stays alive, so on. All, all good, very happy with that, right? Then we do it again, and we keep cycling it. So what do we see this time? We see Hanbin. Hanbin walks up onto the corner, puts some pressure on, right? At the same time, Edison, you see him there, TPing, high ground, right? What happens? Lads react, they focus Hanbin on the corner. Hanbin focuses on staying alive, right? Rest of the team has the freedom to peel for it. So Hanbin bubbles himself, takes the nano. At the same time, what do we see? We see a cooldown commitment from Kevster to get on the corner. We see a cooldown commitment from Reiner to focus Hanbin, right? Um, and then because of that cooldown commitment that we've traded, again, we've traded it for bubble, we've traded it for nano, which 
honestly is very very cheap it, like in terms of sorry it's, which in terms of the fight is actually a lot cheaper than doom cooldowns and echo cooldowns yeah the two very very cooldown reliant heroes for nano and a bubble it's very very cheap right to force these cooldowns out and because you force them out then you can counter push with the Zarya, yeah? And again, works especially well because you had Edison TP on that flank too. And this is kind of what we're seeing for the rest of the match, yeah? We're seeing Fuel walk forward, force the enemy team to commit to something, then push in the enemy downtime, right? And Gladiators, they had three more maps to figure out how to play into it, and they didn't figure it out. Yeah, again, we can see it here from Fielder's POV, right? In that pressure goes on Hanbin. Hanbin's never really under threat of dying. Then he can just push back in. It's a really nice fight. Um, what is going on here? They've done it again. They've done it again. They've double bubbled Edison at the start of the fight. No reason to do this. I, I don't know why they're doing this. They have no reason to do this. Like The, the Zarya is critical because... When she can play on corners like these, she's a threat versus the backline, right? Yeah, okay, she's not physically hitting them right now, but she's a threat versus them. She can come around the corner, she can go hard ground, she can drop onto them, which is, is scary. Yeah, it's scary for these players. They don't want to come around. They don't want to fight a Zarya, which means the enemy team has to put attention on this Zarya if they want to get through the choke. That's the way that Zarya tanks for the team. She's not tanking by standing in main, taking damage. You know, she's not tanking by her Reaper, you know, being here bubbled, right? She's tanking by being a threat versus the enemy backline. And she can only do that if she has energy and usually a bubble, right? If the enemy team knows she has energy, knows she has a bubble, they're going to have to put some attention on her before they kind of abandon their supports to the mercy of the Zarya. Because if the enemy team, they jump straight past the Zarya, tries to go onto Fielder and Chio, then Armbin would have a pretty easy time zoning out the kind of all three of these backline heroes, really, right? Now, obviously, that doesn't work if um, you use you kind of waste all your cooldowns at the start of the fight, bubbling a Reaper, right? Yeah, you've got energy, but it's not really enough. And, like, Edison still gets caught. Chio still gets caught, you know? Um, Glad shouldn't be able to dive past Hanbin like that, yeah? And the reason they could was because Hanbin wastes both his bubbles and Edison's not on an angle. What we'd want, ideally, is for Edison to kind of stay around on that left side, kind of playing a little bit slower, have Hanbin playing on that right side, again, tiny a little bit slower, um, where Sparkle can kind of free spam from the back. We'd probably have Fielder and Shio playing somewhere around here where they can pocket the Tsar, and then the Reaper can just get bubbles across main when he needs to. That's the kind of strong setup. You don't really, uh, you're not really under any pressure to like push with bubbles. You might want to do it as soon as Spawn Door opens to get some energy. Other than that, you don't really need to. So we can kind of see the weakness of dumping both bubbles onto Reaper. They're still kind of getting used to the Zarya comps, you know, they're still fine-tuning it. But if they're playing in, in the kind of playstyle that we've been talking about, then this Zarya comp is really, really good. Really good. Especially versus these type of Doom Engage comps, yeah? Again, another beautiful fight. Another really good example of this, yeah? In that, what have we got? We have Edison putting pressure on here, we have Hanbin putting pressure on, we have the Lucio too. Again, this is critical. Right now, our Ana isn't under pressure, right? Because there's not really much that Glads can do to, to field her up on the high ground, right? The Soldier will be around here somewhere too to help the Ana. So the Lucio doesn't need to stick with her. The Lucio has freedom to play a little bit more aggressively, right? So Lucio's putting on a bit of pressure. Zarya is putting on a bit of pressure. Trace is putting on a bit of pressure, right? Obviously, so are Ana and Soldier up on the high ground, but mostly we're looking at these three players. What this does is it forces the Doom to commit. He has to commit cooldowns, he has to do something versus these players. And then when it happens, because these players were putting on pressure without really committing cooldowns, see, Edison, full cooldowns, full health. Zarya, full cooldowns, full health. Same goes for Lucio, right? And I'm sure that Fielder still has, like, nades and sleeps and stuff, right? Because no one's committed important cooldowns, we're just kind of walking up and doing this without committing important cooldowns. When an engage like this comes in, everyone on the team, they have the cooldowns, they have the attention span, they have everything they need to react to this type of front wall engage, right? Which, again, is exactly what happens. We see, uh, where is he? We see this team kind of peel for Reiner. Now Reiner's 200 health on the front line. The rest of the team engages past him, goes for a trade. 
What do we do? We kill Ant. Even though this Doom's kind of fighting the Zara, he's he's not he's not doing anything. Just managed to get out too. It's I don't know. You have such a great stabilization potential, right? With the Zarya comp. If you can force an engage to come through main like that with no angle. Yep. Yeah. And we can see how Harbin's still doing it in this fight here. He comes around the corner, full health with bubble. Even though he gets engaged on like this, punched into the wall, he's still able to bubble himself, still able to full heal. And what, what have you done? You've forced out all the Doom cooldowns. All their engage potential has just been negated by basically a Zarya bubble and some Ana shots. Yeah? So you see how strong this is. If you're able to walk up main, put pressure on, and force that type of resource trade. Right? Oh. I don't really know how Fielder survives that. But now, again, we force their resource trade. We force the Doom to use his cooldown. So what do we do? We then push back in with the, the Nano. The Nano's are. Yeah? Again, beautiful fight from, from Fuel. And this is just kind of what we see for the rest of the match. Yeah? We're seeing Fuel walk up onto corners, into positions where they can put on pressure without really spending any resources, which is then forcing a dive from Gladiators. Um, and then because... What are they called? Because Dallas, Dallas didn't really use any cooldowns to force that dive. They're then able to push back in during the enemy downtime. <laughs> yeah, we're just kind of seeing the same stuff here. Um, like, Hambin walking forward, grabbing in the enemy spawn, forces out the visor. Then the team just kind of backs up. I don't know. It's, it's a... It's a good... Really good example of a pretty solid playstyle. Getting maybe a little bit too greedy. Um, a little bit too greedy this fight, but that's fine. You get slept out of beat. Ooh. That one's nasty. Nasty, nasty. But we'll see. See what happens here. A nice engage. Again, I don't really know what Glads are doing. They're kind of all just stacked up on cart. They get pressured out of... out of castle. If the enemy team are in a kind of bad position like this, you see, like, someone's here, someone's here. Like, when you're this close to them, and again, like, this is kind of what we are talking about before with the solution thing. When our backline, you see how close Fielder is to these enemies, right? When you're that close to the enemy team, you can just do these type of frontal engages, yeah? We're talking about the skirmish play style stuff more for when we have longer distance between... I assume that's Shu over there. When the distance between like the two backlines is, is longer, then we're looking at that kind of skirmish play style where you're forcing the opening cooldown commitment from the tanks. If the backline are this close, then you can take these types of frontal engages. Yep. Yeah. It's good for... It's good for Dallas to go for this one too. Because they don't have any ults, they need to try and force a fight, and they need to do it before Cart gets across the bridge. So they actually stand a chance of recontesting if this fight fails. Really nice fight from Fielder. I say really nice fight. He, he, he hit asleep. Um, really nice fight from Dallas. But uh, do we care about the rest of this map? As some TP's in with the Reaper ult, zones the back line. Ooh, what's he doing? Right, okay, I don't, yeah. I, not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not too sure what he's doing here. But the initial zonage when he goes in and zones the backline out, that's enough. We don't we're not expecting anything else from our Reaper. If he zones out the enemy backline and gives us a kind of five, ten second window in which we can focus the rest of the enemy team, we're happy with that. Right? Like we're not really expecting that much more from him. So where's the Zari set up? Are they set up on the right while Sparkle's forcing point? What we like to see. Now we're gonna have Hanbin playing cart, the rest of the team's playing above him. Sparkle dies pre-fight, don't really care about that too much. Where on earth is Kevster that he dies here? To Edison. I can't I can't make sense of this um spectating. But the thing I still want to draw attention to, and I know it's just kind of I've just been saying the same thing the whole time, and Archimbold is probably the best has the best examples of it. But because of this setup, right, because Fuel are taking this as a defensive fight, and this is another thing that people haven't understood about push yet, is that there's it's never a reason to take an aggressive fight on push. 
right? Like, I mean, obviously Dallas have to attack, but Glads, they have no reason to, to push into the enemy team here because they still have the card advantage, right? They can take this fight as a defensive fight if they set up for it, yeah? Like, they don't need to run into the enemy team. Right now, what do we see? We see all three backline heroes on the high ground. We see, uh, what's it called? Hanbin's playing, like, somewhere around here on the bottom left, yeah? This is a tough setup to dive into, even if you're opening the sound barrier, right? Because, again, what do we see from Fuel? They haven't spent anything to take these positions, right? They haven't used any cooldowns. They haven't used any of their health pool. There is no opening for gladiators. Gladiators don't have a tracer popped up on the flank ready to flank these players up on high ground, right? There isn't a Zarya that's just used both bubbles and frontline they can run onto, right? There isn't a soldier out of position that they can dive. There isn't a solution here for gladiators, so why are they engaging, right? Like, it's not... It's, it's, it's weird, it's weird. It's like week one... And I guess like week two as well, like this is week two, but like week one and some of week two, you saw all these Doomfists being able to dive in main, being able to jump on stuff and kill things, right? Fuel in particular, they got dominated by Houston because, mostly because of Edison, I am going to blame Edison, right? Standing at the back in main, playing, playing um, soldier, allowing the enemy Echo to flank, right? Not just Edison's fault, but a lot of it was to do with Edison, right? But then we're going to week two, and people have worked out these ways that you're not going to die to just a Doom engage through main because it's so telegraphed, and it very rarely has that type of strong angle from like a tracer popping up on the flank, you know? You don't really have, have those things. So I don't, you, don't, you definitely don't have them in this fight. So like, who knows what, what they see that makes them want to go forward? And it just means that we see again, Hanbin, Bubbles, takes Nano, now the sound barriers, the doom cooldowns, the, the soldier angle, right? That time investment from all of these players to zone out the backline with Edison and to focus Hanbin has just been negated by a bubble, by a nano, right? Which honestly isn't, it's not very, it's not a very expensive commitment. It's just odd, really. But we still, we still like the way that Fuel opened that fight, right? Even though that they are pushing the cart, because they had the advantage, they didn't need to take an aggressive fight while they're pushing the car. They could sit in a position and force the enemy team to come into them, right? Which, it, usually speaking in Overwatch, is a kind of is the easiest way to take a fight. And even though the enemy team's pushing into them now, right, they don't need to dive them because again, they have the car advantage. So they don't need to take the fight as an aggressive fight. They can play it like a defensive fight, right? And probably the best way to do it on Queen Street is when the car's here. If you have some people playing at the back and you're forcing the enemy teams to take a fight around cart, usually you can kind of commit, you can force them to commit to a lane. So they're going to have to have someone cart and they're going to have to have someone kind of go for a flank. Usually it's going to be kind of soldier coming up the stairs. And if you play at the back, you force the enemy team to come into you and you force them to commit to a flank, usually this one or through the mega, then you have a couple of options because you can try and bulldoze your way onto cart, kill whoever's there, or you can run onto the flank, kill whoever's there, right? So. You're playing it as a defensive fight. You're forcing the enemy team to make a split. Because again, to, to win a fight on cart, they need to have an angle. So you're forcing the enemy team to split so they have an angle. As soon as they make that split, you pick one unit to run down and you kill it. Right? That's the way that you want to play push when you have the cart advantage. Gonna nano sparkle? Probably? No? Okay, I, I don't I don't I I'm not sure. You will need to kind of start a fight a little bit earlier than this. You, you can't sit in the same position that long as, a, as Nana. You just get out of the Nano early, force the enemy team to commit. Again, it's like, if you Nano, maybe, maybe Nano Edison or Sparkle, I don't know who's here. If there's players in range, you Nano Sparkle. If they're further back, Nano Edison. But Nano someone to force the enemy team to do something. Either they'll run away, and then you have space, you just push cart, you're fine. Or they commit onto you because you've used ults, right? They're trying to kind of run into you before the ults get value. In which case, you force them to take an engage. Both situations you're very, very happy with, especially if you're playing the Zarya comp, right? So I, I don't know what Fuel are doing here. Um, especially the Ana breaking LOS. Like, the Ana breaks LOS so long with the Zar. Not only can the Ana not get bubbled, but we also see Hanbin drop super, super low. So it means that Hanbin's not able to go forward and force those engages. Um, like, you don't want to break LOS with the Ana. You, you can break LOS with the Ana as long as it happens when the enemy dives, right? 
if you if you're full health, full cooldowns when the enemy dive in, you can afford to break LOS with the Ana for you know a good like five or ten seconds, right? That time it will take to clear a doom from the back line, clear a tracer from the back line, that type of stuff. But you can't do that in the pre-fight. In the pre-fight, you need to be pocked in the Zarya so the Zarya can walk up and fight. Um, and you need to keep LOS to your Ana in case she does get flanked by tracer, that type of stuff. So yeah, I, I don't really know what um, don't really know what fuel we're doing there, and it, it's, they're getting close to throwing this map for it too. Let's have a look. I don't know the, these fights where you just peel for the backline. They're brutal, brutal. You come in with a big punch, gets bubbled, gets nano. Like there's not not much that Reiner can do. And again, we see how far forward Edison's, oh, it's not Edison, we see how far forward Hanbin's playing, right? Look at the distance between the Zarya and the backline. That's the critical part, right? We're not bunched up with the Zarya fighting with the Zarya. She's not brawling versus the Doom with us in the backline. She's walking forward because the important thing for the Zarya isn't that she can put damage on the Doom when the Doom comes in, it's that she can stop enemies like Ants and Kevster and Shu, probably not Kevster, sorry, stop enemies like Ants and Shu and Funny Astro from speed boosting through main and getting their own angle, right? The Zarya is here to put pressure on these backline heroes, yeah? And again, it doesn't mean she's literally doing damage to them, it just means that she's zoning out this area so that these players can't come in and follow up. Basically the same way that you would want your monkey to kind of jump in and drop bubble in main, yeah? Again, to zone out heals, to zone out kind of uh, range DPS from supporting the dive. Again, I want to see the way that fuel set up for these fights because, again, they don't need to treat it. I, I, I suppose they do kind of need to treat it as an offensive fight because they have the cart, right? Oh, sorry, because the enemy team has the cart, so they need to push it. But hopefully, from Gladys' perspective, we're not looking at them thinking that they need to go to cart straight away. You know, we, we want them to take 10, 20 seconds to set up good flanks, good dives before they go in. Yeah. We're not, we don't want them just to run straight on cart to stop them pushing cart. We want them to set up a good fight because they have the time to do it because they have the current lead. It's going to be interesting to see how they throw this because really they should win this map. Again, we see Reiner just drop on cart and sit on cart. What's he diving here? It goes on the inside, pulls his ult. Try and peel for the back line, Kevster gets caught. I, I don't know what we're looking at, to be honest. I don't know why. I don't know why Ants is there. I don't know why Ants isn't like running into that. Wait, it'll change wait till we change POV. Um I don't know why Ants isn't like because he starts here at the start of the fight. I don't know why he's not running into this room and spamming from that window. And that where he can then run back and spam from this window and drop behind them as well if he needs to. Like, I, I, he shouldn't be playing in main. Reiner going in, forcing something with the Doom ult is fine. Because again, you forced out this blade by going in with Doom. So that's fine. That's fine. But Kevster shouldn't be getting caught. Ant shouldn't be getting bladed. Shouldn't be running around in main. Like, you still catch Sparkle. But then again, this is, this is kind of where we want the Zarya to be. We want the Zarya to be in a position close enough to the enemy team. But when these fights start to kind of devolve and get a bit messy, the Zarya, she's either zoning these players out so that like Ant and Chu aren't able to play close enough to support the team, or they're so close to support the team that she can just run into them and, and do DPS and kill them, right? Because um, again, like doing exactly the same to Shu here, right? She's able to walk onto them and zone them out. All right, good luck with the essay. Sorry if you're already gone. Um, but no, good luck with the essay. Right. So we swapped to the, the monkey, which is probably the better swap. Rhino's monkey's been, been good as well. I, I don't know why they hadn't gone to it more. Um, you still have card advantage, right? You still have card advantage. You don't need to take this fight as an aggressive fight. You can play it defensive, you can make them run into your setup. That doesn't mean you want to sit at the back and play slow and get nanoed, but it means you can make them walk into your setup, right? 
And I think you've already, by the time we get to that nano, I think you've already missed the chance. Why is Reiner jumping on point using these Zarya cooldowns? Or sorry, using these monkey cooldowns. What does he see? Ah, is this bubble that just ruins the fight for them? Is this bubble is just, it's the end of it. You, you have a soldier, you have a tracer, you have Anna Lucio, you, you know, you have people that can drop main, speed boost into this room, you know? Play from this room. Your monkey can dive in at the same time. You can find a player in the back line. You have those options, right? I know we're talking about treating it like a defensive fight. That doesn't mean we're standing at the back waiting for the enemy team to come into us. What it means is we're forcing the enemy team to commit to a position because we're poking them early. So we're coming out, we're poking them early. We're forcing maybe the Zarya to commit on cart, the Ana to commit in the room. We're making them commit. Like commit to a position, commit to a lane. That's how we play defensive fights. Once they commit to a lane, then it should be pretty obvious where the best place for us to dive is, right? Maybe the Zarya's committed too far up on cart and we can kill her. Probably going to be pretty rare. Or maybe once the Ana commits on this right side, we know that we, or sorry, kind of like the left side, really. Like around, like around, around that way. I'm drawing it off the screen. Um, once the Ana kind of commits around this way, then we know we can drop around, rotate behind, you know, push behind them. There, there, there'll be an option somewhere, right? I don't know what on earth this monkey cooldown is meant to do. But we, we, we miss our chance here so, so much. Like, I don't know why these players are just trading damage in main. It doesn't make sense. No one needs to be here, right? The monkey doesn't need pocket to do this. The monkey can walk up on the corner. Tracer can kind of play with him if, if you need to. But Shu doesn't need to be here hard scoping a monkey. He doesn't want to be here hard scoping a monkey. Ants doesn't need to be on high ground spamming who knows what, right? Like... Kepster doesn't need to be here in main. Like, like, none of these players need to be here. They can all be looking for chances to find, you know, Genji on the flank, find a soldier, you know, get in position to speed boost on the back line with a nade. You know, you, you can do those things. Um, like, they're playing so slow and wasting these cooldowns. Bubbles out, jumps out. What have we What have we earned for it? Absolutely nothing, right? And that bubble, that jump, I, I jump's going to be back, but the bubble isn't going to be back in time to effectively take a fight. All you're going to be able to use those next cooldowns for is going to be to jump on cart and play to stall. So this fight has been lost 20 seconds ago, you know? And because we're not using any of these cooldowns to take space, play aggressive, it just means Ants, who has been up on the high ground for like 30 seconds in the same position, gets engaged on. And like, it's a nice <laughs> sparkle still dies. But like, uh, I don't know. Reiner, again, all he can do with his cooldowns, contest cart, dies for it. Now, Fuel taking the lead. Glads don't really stand a chance of winning the map from here. Yeah? So, really, really weird.